All right. Hello out there and well, uh, and wherever you're listening from, welcome to another edition of our Eurythmics podcast. My name is Mark Stevens, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, longtime friend, and webmaster for the Eurythmics Video Visionaries website, Rex Saldana. Rex, yep. how are you today? Doing just great, Mark. Thanks for the nice introduction. <laughs> <laughs> As always, uh, our regular followers know that the official name of this podcast is Eurythmics, the music and videos of Annie Lennox and Dave Stewart. So you can imagine the real thrill that Rex and I have to welcome the man himself, Mr. David A. Stewart, somewhat less formal. Most of us call him Dave. Welcome, Dave. It's, a, it's such a thrill to bring you to a podcast that's actually partly named in your honor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. I, uh, <clears throat> yeah, that's probably the only one that I know of that is uh, named in mine and Annie's honor. And uh, no, it's great that you uh, have been such uh, great fans, followers for years, creating your own, you know, uh, well, Rex making video visionaries, which I've and known about for quite a long time and the fact that you are doing this because as you know uh, there's a labyrinth of music coming out every day now you know yes. something ridiculous like a hundred thousand songs a day are being uploaded and um it's like a sea or it's like a jungle out there it makes you wonder how you keep from going under if you know what i mean and um so to be you know, remembered, you know, going onwards and, you know, introducing new people, young people to our music. I always appreciate it because you just can't take anything for granted. You know? no. Well, thank you, David. And I have to say that that is the main reason I started my website is I wanted I wanted to pass on information about Eurythmics to anybody who didn't know or to younger generations who are coming up. I just, I look at it as like an educational tool. So I appreciate your, your kind words. Thank you. And, and this is our 14th podcast. So we've been doing, you know, a variety of podcasts. We started, you know, talking about your videos and we've done specific podcasts about a specific album. We've had Jimmy Z and Joe mm -hmm. Nees Jameson on, which were both real and Joe Nees and Jimmy, both hilarious. They, they told really funny stories about you, Dave. I don't know but if you know this oh, story. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, I can imagine. I could <laughs> tell very funny stories about them too, but I will. <laughs> All right. Funny, funny but flattering stories. Very flattering stories. Yes. Yes. Um, so, you know, we, we've been trying to connect with you for the last few weeks and, you know, and sometimes, you know, uh, technology doesn't work necessarily as, as well as we want it to. Uh, and, but you were on a ship going to England when we were trying, we couldn't get a good connection, but I'm fascinated by that, your transatlantic trip, that's not the most, that's not the usual way for you to get to England. I'm just curious if you could tell us a little bit about why you did that. Yeah, well, we were uh, told that, you know, they, do, they would have great, uh, you know, internet you know, you bought a certain kind of uh, package of, but I, you know, for me, it was uh, a nightmare because I had, you know, my Ebony McQueen box set coming out and I thought, oh, great. I'll leisurely be on the Queen Mary and do interviews uh, with various people. I mean, it wasn't just you guys. I, I had, a, you know, everything from Channel 4, the BBC, the Radio 2, all of this stuff lined up to do on the boat. And the, I only managed to do one, and that was by using the boat's satellite phone. And I think really? that was to radio. Yeah, that was to radio too, I think. Um, oh, wow. So, so I had to actually, when I got to the UK, uh, you know, people that were working on my um, record, you know, um, radio promotion and press, they had to reorganize everything. So then while I was in Sunderland, you know, I was like, doing like five different interviews and going to Newcastle to do a TV and then going back to Sunderland to do more interviews because they'd all piled up. And by then, of course, the box set had been out a week because we set sail and it came out virtually the day or the day after we set sail. 
or the day before. So, uh, and it was funny because um, I also didn't take into account, well, you know, because I planned five months before uh, to put something up every, uh, I think every other week or whenever it was, or a song every Tuesday, that's right. Yeah. A 60 second snippet every Tuesday. So there was like 23 songs in a row. So that ended up on that Friday to be released. Funnily enough, it was the same Friday Harry Styles was releasing his album. And then when I arrived in Britain, it was the Queen's Jubilee and just everything. So I've just come back literally now. I've just been walking through Hyde Park and, uh, well, you know, it's just packed, you know, with uh, just millions and millions of people. Yeah. And uh, right in the heart of it all. So um, it was quite funny. I decided to take my guitar, the original Blue Takamini I've played on many Eurythmics tours and records. I always go to this shop in Denmark Street, a very famous street where um, Tin Pan Alley, it was called, where mm -hmm. the Beatles and the Stones and the Kinks, and the, they all went there and in the studios and bought guitars and, I just took it there to get um, looked at because it had some little things wrong with it because I wanted to be great when Annie and I perform at the American uh, Songwriters Hall of Fame when we're being inducted on yeah. June the 16th. So I, I just want to make sure that guitar's still working fine because it's nearly 40, well, it's 40 years old now, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. You, you had it out on the street while all these other people are out there. Uh, yeah, well, I stupidly decided to carry it. The case is so heavy, and it's quite near Denmark's, Denmark Street, so I thought I'll just carry it without the case. And then I thought, <laughs> when, I, when I got outside, I thought, uh-oh, so I better put my head there all the way. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> it was fine in the end. So no one, no, one, no one noticed it was Dave Stewart going down the street with his guitar. Ah, uh, there was, I think there was a few people who were not quite sure, but I kept my head down. Just well, straight ahead. you've done a huge amount of TV interviews. I've, I've been watching them here online. You, yeah. You've been in public quite a, quite a bit lately, so I suspect they did know you were going down the street. So let's talk about that really quick. Um, we do, we want to congratulate you, Dave, uh, that you and Annie not only the Songwriters Hall of Fame that's coming out, which of course you were uh, inducted in 2020, but of course COVID delayed the actual ceremony. So congratulations on that. Congratulations on the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Wow. Yes, that's congratulations. <laughs> Well-deserved and, and long time coming. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, um, so we, were, we weren't expecting to be inducted into either. Um, even though we'd been nominated for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame before. Um, so, yeah, it was a pleasant surprise when we realized we're actually being <clears throat> in the ceremonies twice in one year. Yeah. So, um, obviously, if it was just up to me, I would go, great, let's do a whole uh, really nice tour for all the fans, perform all of those selection of songs from the various albums and that would be a, yeah it would be a great feeling uh you know i think for the fans and for me personally and um you know it but it obviously it's down to annie who has to sort of uh think about that idea of playing concerts and singing yeah. live not just for 20 minutes but you know for 90 minutes or whatever and all of the moving and flying of that. Obviously, that could be made really, really easy. But, um, uh, Mark, you know, I would love to do that. Yeah, you know, Mark and I were talking about the possibility of maybe Eurythmics doing virtual concerts, where you guys yeah. just have a band in a studio and you perform a concert and we all just watch it virtually. Yeah. Hey, Rex, your voice, by the way, is really, really loud. Okay. Um, I don't think we'll alter it down a bit. Um, so, well, yeah, I mean, listen, obviously every single thing has been proposed to us, uh, you know, whether it's like, okay, um, how about we uh, create, this is before there was even 
the latest technology, you know, how about we create avatars of you and Manny and, you know, a show like, a show like the Avatar, uh, sorry, like the ABBA show that's just come out or we've been, you know, uh, approached by many companies to do all sorts of things and obviously approached by the major concert promoters and to tour and um i you know i'm interested in any anything that is brought to me that could really get across something that has uh, the emotion and the feeling i think some of those things um yeah virtual concert obviously can a bit where you're actually just watching the real people perform but you're in your living room it can a bit but as you know being at an actual concert is a slightly different experience. Mm. I don't think they've really quite got there yet, you know, with, uh, you know, performances in the metaverse. and You know, mm. it's coming. It's going to come. You're going to end up literally come home, flick on your wall, you know, the whole wall, and just say, you're a mixing concert or whatever. And... <laughs> It'll be that, you know, and it will be totally immersive and interactive and you'll feel a lot more like you are part of a, a whole world of other fans and they'll all be there if you want them, you know. It's nearly there. And a lot of technology companies will say, oh, no, we're there already. And I'm like, well, I'm looking at everything. And, you know, it's you literally in five years to ten years it will be nuts, you know, it will be as, uh, as, um, as anybody could widely imagine, it will be. Yes. Yeah, I, I saw you in an interview just, uh, I think it was yesterday, it was a television interview, and it was interesting because you used the same word, but you said to this interviewer that when you and Annie get together, and you said it's about emotion, and you used that same word a moment ago. It it is an emotional yeah. experience. Um, from I'm, I'm sure for you all, for the people watching you, for listening, it's a, it's yeah. an entirely emotional thing. So you 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 don't want to lose that in in the metaverse or whatever it's called. You know, you don't want to lose that. You that is the essence of music. You want to feel yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. No, that's true. And obviously, with Annie and myself. Um, there's a sort of, as Annie says, one plus one equals three, but there's this extra emotional experience of people who, you know, were actually living together as a couple, then deciding not to live together, but to feel that we had something so um, bonding that we would create a duo and make all that music and records. Now, a lot of people ask, me um how did you and annie cope with like not being a, a couple anymore but making you know nine albums or whatever and touring and being together all the time now <clears throat> sometimes it, uh, at the beginning it wasn't uh, as easy as you know as you can imagine because it gets very sort of blurry edges you know mm -hmm. and um, but one thing that we never lost was we never lost the, the sight of trying to make something remarkable in a concert or in recording. So having that joint sort of like vision that we've got to make this great, right? Like we can't just go, well, that's okay, you know? Uh, yeah. And so every tiny thing in a concert um, and the way that we were going to perform songs or the way that we were going to um deliver music in various ways like if we got tired of one way we'd say well that's no good because we're going to lose the emotion so let's try it this way let's try it with just an acoustic guitar and voice let's oh let's you know and we never ever stopped so the first thing that annie and i talked about when we were told about performing in the songwriters hall of fame and the rock and roll hall of fame was not Hooray, you know, it was a bit of that, but it was like, right, how should we do it? How should we do it that captures that thing again? Yeah. Um, and 
you know, which way, uh, I can't tell, I'm not allowed to say which way we're going to do it, but, you know, we were just talking about <coughs> we need to be, and of course both of us want to be uh, in agreement, and we usually are, like, let's do it like this. Okay, there's never really been, no, let's do it like, you know, a completely different way. We're usually on the same page when it comes to that. So much so that when we wrote songs together, and I've said this many times, they very rarely took more than 15 minutes to 30 minutes. Uh, because once uh, the essence of the idea was there, and it could be two lines out of Annie's journal or me playing some strange chords or the opening to Thorn in My Side or, or whatever it might be, um, if we both liked what the other one was doing, I describe it as like a starting pistol going off on a race. And it was right. suddenly, we're both going really quickly to the finish line with all sorts of things happening. And usually nobody else, well, I think 99% of the time, nobody else was there. So, because if somebody else was there, we found it sort of interfered with the actual um, vibration in the room. Not meaning there were being bad vibrations, it was just there was something happening that was magical that it's like would break the spell. So we would have to kindly say to the, an engineer or whoever was with us, sorry, but we have to be on our own now. And whether that was in the big room in the church or a tiny little room in the suburbs of Paris or wherever it was, or crammed into a tiny little sort of room on the side of a studio and Annie reading me, she'd just written these words, sisters are doing it for themselves, saying I've written a poem. And I was going, no, you've written a song. And I'd start playing doodle doodle doom 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 And there's just the two of us crammed in this, like the size of a wardrobe. And, uh, but we always had to be on our own, you know, doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And interesting. And on the concert you were talking about, um, and you did right before the pandemic, you had done your rhythmic songbook. Um, and you're talking about the ways that you've been presented in concerts and, and I, unfortunately, I was not at that show, but I did see some, you know, where people put it up on YouTube. I think I told you that once in an interview. But um, I thought the how you started that out and the visuals of that and the little bit of music from Take Me to Your Heart and, you know, yeah. that was that was that was exciting. It, it, mm -hmm. it just feels the, the, and yeah. to be live, I think, must have been incredible. So you've always done that. Yeah, well, um, yeah, it's interesting that because that was, I think, in September, October, just before uh, the pandemic year, which started. And then in Christmas, you know, just in December time, Annie and I played in New York. But I'd just done that show. I was invited by um, Nile Rogers. It, it's a thing where... It's called Meltdown, where an artist each year, so David Bowie did it one year, and Patti Smith, they ask people, uh, would you like to perform at Meltdown Festival? And it will go on for like eight days, and there's different venues, but the main venue is the World Festival Hall. So he asked me, Dave, could you put on a show of Eurythmic songs as the main you know, thing at the World Festival Hall? So I took it really seriously and uh, went, you know, into the whole idea of like, well, I would like really long screens and I had imagery on the screens and I, in rehearsal, I was separating the train wheels, you know, from uh, this city never sleeps, the underground wheels and made this very kind of surreal beginning, almost like uh, a mythical or voodoo beginning. And out of that, I, I came, you know, with bits of Never Gonna Cry Again, Take Me To Your Heart, ending up into this city never sleeps, when suddenly people realized, crept on stage with a whole gospel choir and 
players lit or one by one. And it was a, it was a real sort of, um, you know, you, you couldn't really have just said, oh, we're going to play a show, do a rehearsal and do it. No, it was, I thought that every tiny piece of it and um, invited certain people, you know, Emily Sanday to sing uh, Miracle of Love and uh, Beverly Knight, just different singers. So as not to have one person, you know, trying to emulate Annie or anything like that. It was, they were all very different. And, um, and go through a sort of, it was almost like a little journey through the Eurythmics world. Mm -hmm. And, and it was great and it was thoroughly enjoyable. And then when Annie and I got together in New York, of course, uh, the audience went, went bananas. They, they wanted more, but there was other people on Bruce Springsteen and Sting and other people. Um, but it, Sorry? The rainforest, it was for the rainforest, uh, Sting, Sting's rainforest, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 that's right, yeah. And, um, but then we only played like two or three songs. On the show I did in London, I think I did like two hours or something like that. And, um, but what's interesting is for us, you know, songs who were written like 40 years ago, um, you know, like Sweet Dreams was written 40 years ago. Um, what's interesting is like, the, as soon as the downbeat happens and the riff starts, you could do that for like 10 minutes <laughs> and the audience is to still be going bananas, but like right. you could also do the intro to This City Never Sleeps for five minutes, you know, it's just got, and those, sort of feelings and those um, grooves or beats mixed with those little riffs like <clears throat> or for instance The Walk which I see some of Sweet Dreams album I made the backing tracks in my bedroom with a tiny setup you know not even an eight track like the you know the dun 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 that's me playing on a little synthesizer in the bedroom and like they always want to have these like memorable feelings before even the vocal comes in. It's like, it has to have an atmosphere. Yeah. Now, one of the reasons is when you've got a vocalist and a songwriter and a performer artist as brilliant as Annie, that has got a lot of emotion in her voice, you need to set that up, you know? You need to set it up on a plate. You can't just have any old thing going on right. and so you know even like never gonna cry again with that dun, 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 jingy jingy you like you know or oh, take me to your heart uh, uh, from the in the garden album had these moments in it you know and um, then they were developed a bit further on the sweet dreams album and obviously that's when i uh I'd learned a lot from Connie Plank and decided to put it into practice. And, but, you know, when you go on to like the Touch album, um, we started to add more complex things. Like um, I started to play, because you know, before Sweet Dreams, I decided not to play the guitar for a while. I was going to play something I didn't understand because that's like, um, it's a great sort of free falling into an art genre and not knowing what you're doing, you know, and uh, stop making sense, as David Byrne would say. So that's why a lot of the Sweet Dream stuff had a simplistic but very strong bass lines and, you know, things about it, you know. Even on like, <clears throat> Love is a Stranger, right? So when I did play the guitar, it was very unusual, like you'd have to really listen hard to realize it wasn't the synthesizer. If I'm playing in between, you know, uh, or if on Love is a Strange, I'm going in between the chords, mm -hmm. 
I was didn't want anything to sound like exactly like a guitar. So, mm-hmm. um, and everybody thought, oh, you know, in America and places, oh, they're a synth pop duo. But obviously, on touch, suddenly I'm playing a big Gretsch country gent guitar, and there's a whole orchestra, you know, uh, arranged by Michael Kamen. And here comes the rain again. And here comes the rain again. Has a drum machine again, a synthesizer, a bass, but then it has a big open six string Gretsch guitar, which is a big semi acoustic guitar, and a whole orchestra. And um, then you couldn't define us. People, you know, if they said, Oh, you're a pop synth band, we'd say, Well, hang on, but there's a whole orchestra and there's guitars. And then obviously, we then allowed ourselves because we didn't want to get put in a box so we allowed ourselves to do anything you see what i mean it was like a little bit like we knew that we were gonna okay we don't want to be stuck in a world so let's do this and there would be complex things like um i'm producing there must be an angel playing with my heart and he came in with almost a fully written song you know uh and it was like oh so it was very different it was almost like a, as if a, it was a stevie wonderish kind of feeling mm-hmm. and uh and so the production is very unusual and i got like an opera singer from the paris opera house to sing that very high descending part and a harp player real harps and drum machines and then I said well rather than it being a Stevie Wonder song let's get into play the harmonic harmonic see so the amount of strange instruments mixed together on that one song in America they couldn't get their head around it it was like <laughs> number 86 with an anchor or something and in Britain it was number one because you yeah, see that's... in Britain very different uh way of looking at music and the radio and everything is not so analyzed and segregated into uh because you know you see the advertisers in america they want to know the demographic so they want to put all the music into a certain category so they can go okay that's this kind of people whereas in britain they couldn't care less on the bbc because it's not commercial you can't advertise on it anyway so it was great so yeah me growing up you know for the first time discovering music and playing the guitar or learning the guitar i put on the radio and it could be the beatles followed by dusty springfield followed by the kinks followed by you know frank sinatra followed by you know what i mean nobody was going oh my god well this is all over the place so on one record like there must be an angel which has many different things happening they weren't bothered about that mm-hmm. yeah. yes but, but that's what you and annie did with with each album each album was its own thing its own sound it, it didn't matter what you had done before uh here was something new was that a dangerous thing to be doing because in the music world in general outside of you know the bbc or they they want to they do they want to put you in a box and oh wait you were a synth fan so you're supposed to but you you both defied that and you found success nevertheless well yeah now that is a testament to the strength of a song hmm. you know if so we always were like well <clears throat> the song has to be able to exist on acoustic guitar and Annie singing. Exactly. Or a, pia- or a piano and Annie singing. So without anything else, like strip everything else out. And like we can play every song, even the weirdest ones, we can play like that, right? The only one probably would be difficult would be, I love to listen to Beethoven. <laughs> I was and, just thinking about that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, because Annie, Annie's not really singing on it. You know, that was whole song was, and most of that album, I was just making on my own 
and making it out of bits of stuff, you know, put together. Now, this is before sampling, but I was kind of sampling. <laughs> and, you know, like Heaven, the track Heaven, that's just me putting together little things that Annie had sang or said mixed with the actual um, recorded music that I've composed. And, you know, it becomes this very strange collage of which I love the video that Sophie Muller made with Annie mm -hmm. down the corridor and in the hotel and bouncing off the walls and, you know. Yeah, that's great stuff. And you make a kind of surrealistic montage visually and sound wise. And then Annie in Paris, when I had all of this music um, on Savage, which at first Annie wasn't keen on a lot of it, but then she had this massive epiphany in Paris and the, the song Savage, she came up with some of her greatest lyrics and and so you've placed a chill in my heart and all this stuff came pouring out, you know? And so that was a, one of the only albums where the two of us like were in separate places and times, but then we came together in Paris and it all just sort of somehow fit together. But um, the rest of the time we were sat together with a guitar, if there was a piano around or a synthesizer, and we would just make everything up on the spot. And um, and it's, you know, I've worked, obviously written songs with other artists where that has happened, you know, um, like with Gwen Stefani, you know, it was all done in like 15 minutes or 30 minutes underneath it all. And with Just Up, and you know, like some of those songs, very similar, and Iris Go, like half an hour, but not nine albums worth, if you know what I mean. So, okay. so with that, with Annie, it happens like every time. Yeah, um, the, yeah. And then of course, you you were talking about Savage. Of course, that's a fan favorite. I will tell you, Dave, um, if you and Annie are, are ever in concert again together for something, and you somehow do something with Beethoven, the crowd is going to go insane. Okay. <laughs> Just <do> that. <laughs> insane. Well, you know. Do you know, if I was going to do you a think concert again, it's funny you should say that because I actually thought of an opening that starts with that. And it's just, the whole thing starts with that. We're not even on stage with yet, but I would make a mix where it just keeps going, I love to mm -hmm. listen to, no, no beat yet, just I love to listen to. And then you bring in Beethoven, and then do 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 da, 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 da. Oh. And after about three or four minutes, you suddenly hear this do 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 do, you know, which is. Um, and then you could bring in the whole electronic riff, and the first part you would just could just see on a big screen, the the coming together like the going up the stairs, which was the stairs of my Paris apartment actually. Oh, um, really? That's interesting. And, um, yeah, and so when the door then gets to the door and it opens, it then it was on a set, but that was going up the stairs of my Paris apartment. But um, yeah, I mean, there's all sorts, obviously, nowadays that you can do that you couldn't do before. Like if Ed Sheeran just played um, at Sunderland Stadium of Light. Now, if you look at the way he performs in the center and, the, and the, all of the things, you know, screens, in being not projected anymore, but real screens in a shape of whatever you want. I mean, the, the mind boggles to what you could do in a Eurythmics concert, mm -hmm. um, you know, to do with imagery and songs and um, performance. Now that's not to say that just playing straight forward in a band with Clem Burke and Joni Jameson on back and vocals and Jimmy Z on a harmonica, and Pat Simon on keyboards, Chucho on bass on the Revenge Tour. They were all brilliant, you know? And my my thing there was, I wanted to choose a band where they were all stars. So yeah. Clam, drumming, like star, 
Jimmy Z and get him to come all the way forward, not like a backing band and go mad on the harmonica to whatever, you know, and, you know, Johnny's, you know, be part of the whole thing. So it was like watching a kind of a stellar performance from everybody, you know? Yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that really worked. And just to confuse our record label, we were like, right, so that was Revenge and now Savage. <laughs> and the yeah. first single, imagine me going into the label and delivering our first single as I love to listen to Beethoven. And he's not even singing on it. She's talking, you know, and like, and there's just this sampled voices and she's going, I was dreaming like a Texan girl and like the record label, like, ah, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine the reaction it must have, it must have gotten. No, no, it was heart failures going on, I think. <laughs> that reminds me of a, oh, I'm sorry. That reminds me of a story, I think, in your in your autobiography, Dave, where you mentioned where you delivered Be Yourself Tonight to the uh, record executive, and he was completely clueless. Like, apparently, he wasn't a music industry person. And he said, oh, it sounds like Ghostbusters. Uh, he, 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 had just come from, he had just come uh, over from Hertz Rent-A-Car. <laughs> he was the CEO of Hertz Rent-A-Car to be the head of RCA. And he said, he was a huge Colombian guy. He said, uh, Stuart, I love it, just like Ghostbusters. And I was like, what? <laughs> anyway, uh, that's the same chap that was, him and his wife was murdered in the famous Menendez trial, yes. you know, that's yeah. by their yeah. sons. And uh, yeah, so yeah, then as uh, I think it was William Burroughs said it, I don't know, maybe not, the music industry, you know, the poem about it, it's dark and shallow. <laughs> You know, it's <laughs> trenches. I can't remember the poem, but there's, uh, yeah, there's bodies everywhere in the music industry. You know, it's like anywhere where there's cash involved, whether it was handing over cash to buy records or tickets at a concert, there's going to be really dark, strange people around that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, can be uh, <clears throat> called various, you know, uh, groups of people like some people call it the mob or whatever you want to call it but uh, you know uh, uh, there's always going to be some underhand dealings going on in every industry and in every trade and every business whether it's you're selling you know furniture or whatever you know there's and it's just a certain tiny percentage of people that see an opportunity to you know, do something underhand for the benefit of themselves or whatever. So, um, yeah, so that was the head of, unfortunately, was the head of how labeled in America, Jose Menendez. Are you, are you ever, from what you just said, are you ever surprised that you made it through all this with those certain kinds of people, you know, that, you know, that you, uh, you made Well, I, um, you know, I think it's a miracle that we're all alive, really. So, you know, there's much more dangerous and uh, terrible situations that half the world is in, mm. uh, you know, that. So I would never think, oh, you know, I made it through that alive. I mean, you know, the, the most common way of ending up uh, not alive in the music industry is drugs, you know. There's yeah. not many, many real sort of like murders or terrible things but there's a lot of just musicians just getting ripped off and all their money stolen from them and Eurythmics you know fell foul of that in some ways and in some ways survived you know but but you know what's going on in the world is uh, so um, scary and always has been I always have to remind myself well if you read history books it wasn't so good being a Christian in Roman times you know <laughs> Exactly. Get tossed to the lions or what. People are always wandering around trying to take other people's land or trying to sort of manipulate other people to do this or that on large scales. So, you know, whether it's a giant dictator or whether it's in a smaller world, you know. So yeah. I think we're very sort of <clears throat> blessed to have been able to make music and to perform it, you know. 
Yeah. Well, I was going to say that just that same thing because of, you know, there is so much going on around us and so many bad things. But music is something that people can go to and hold on to and find comfort in. And uh, I think that's a nice thing that you brought that. I mean, to the point of, you know, your performances and, and Rex and I were laughing about this earlier. You know, we both have our hotel booked to see you and Annie at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. We don't even know if we can get tickets to the concert yet. <laughs> we got the hotel booked. <laughs> but we, well, we, well, I, I, I saw it's the good first step. Um, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's well, a lot to think about. Yeah. Music. I was, I was going to say, yeah, you, when you mentioned about music, you see, in the song on uh, Ebony McQueen, the album behind you, the box set there, I say, uh, music is not blind to the way you feel. It's always real, and there's so many colours to reveal. And that's true. You see, music can be a friend through thick and thin, you know? And um, it saved many people's lives people suffering from anxiety, depression, and either saved them or helped them through certain periods and always will. Um, but it's definitely helped save me, you know, when I was a kid. And the discovery of music and the ability to play it, which I never imagined I could, has um, been the one true thing that stayed you know, part of me and stayed with me and is a comfort to me to this day, you know, when I'm just on my own playing the guitar or if I'm putting on a nice vinyl record, sitting outside and listening to early blues music or, you know, all sorts of different kind of music. That's the amazing thing. I try to say so many colors to reveal, you know. Some people are completely obsessed with um, a certain genre, you know, that bands like Metallica would fall in or uh, Rammstein or, you know, and death metal music and dark music can bring a massive amount of comfort to some people and lots of goth music does and soul music does and classical music does. I mean, <clears throat> there's not many other things in the world apart from food where there's so many different kinds of, of it that brings comfort to so many different kinds of people. And uh, there's not many things that put people totally in the moment that beats music or some, some sports, you know, where people forget everything and they're just like, oh my God, you know. Um, and that's badly needed, especially nowadays because you might have stress on people now to actually keep up with the pace of life that sped up. This Frenchman did a study when he filmed a street in Paris and he filmed it in, uh, you know, almost like stop frame for 10 years, right? The same part of the street. And he actually saw that people were actually walking faster. Like, so at first they're ambling along the street and then by the end, they were going as fast as they can along the street, you know? Now, <clears throat> as an, there's an urgency that's been put on everybody's head, particularly teenagers, you know, who are dealing with social media and all, all sorts of stuff bombarding them. And there's always been a slight urgency put on everybody's head. If you want to go back to 1984, right? and what that whole dystopian world is about. Well, what I realized, you know, most of my life is from the age of five or whatever, when you're in school, they give people, you know, kids, little tests, you know, that build up to when you're 11 and there's like bigger and bigger tests. And then you go to a secondary, the next part of the schooling system Oh, more tests and exams, <laughs> like, you know, and they're deciding very early on, oh, this kid's going to be a builder or a plumber, this one's possibly going to be a, a politician or a doctor, or, you know, right. and it's pretty scary, you know, because the people that they put on this side that think, oh, they could be 
Oh, yeah, they should go over there. They're going to be uh, do something in their physical kind of work. Often they're the ones that come up with the most genius ideas, and the ones that they put over there actually are put to so much stress they fall out. You know, so there's this sorting system that happens, and it was implemented, you know, years ago. And it, when it gets to the point of college and university, it's so stressful. And you know, you know that some people actually commit suicide over their exams and and they go into massive debt and like parents are so stressed about trying to get their kid to college. And, you know, most people I've met who've fallen out, and how this isn't anybody watching this going, hey, Dave Stewart says I should just, you know, drop out, tune in, turn on and drop out. But most people I've met that did drop out or fail or do one year at college and think it's not for me, I'm going to be a filmmaker or whatever, turn out to be um, really pretty good at what they do because they, they dive into that experience, whether it's a Ridley Scott or whether it's, um, you know, uh, somebody who's decided to be uh, an illustrator or whatever, <clears throat> they've took away the exam feeling <clears throat> and started to just do it and just yeah. do it and uh, like you know not always be judged all the time they'll be the judge of themselves isn't that the essence of ebony mcqueen your your album and the concept of the magic of being and being your yourself and what you're turning into and and and, and taking that road that somehow you're led down um, it, it, that's sort of the essence of it. Is that not it? It is, and uh, it's it's. You see, some people have a moment, like an epiphany, a moment in time, <clears throat> where something happens, and they could go one way or the other. Sure. And you know, this can be anything. From my case, it was an accident. I broke my knee, and putting on a record, right? Now, how would you tie the two things together? You can't. But something in me must have been open to, oh, this is a moment because I kind of went into a trance. Now, lots of people have it. You know, the first time they see a, and touch a horse, they go, oh, my God, this is my life. Mm -hmm. I just want to work with horses, you know. And or a million things, you know, they just... but. Some people at that moment, they're maybe not tuned into the moment, so it kind of passes by. And there might only be a few moments where this kind of thing happens. Mm. And I was lucky enough to be in a state, it was an enforced state, you know, it was like at home, my mom had left my dad, my brother was going to college, my Dad was depressed, going to work. I'd broken my knee. And I found this record and I put it on. Now, it's kind of weird. It's like the stars lining up in a very weird way. You know what I mean? It's like you would not really put that jigsaw puzzle together, right? It just doesn't look like it's a good fit. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> that's what my record and the movie we're going to make and the musical is about, is because at the moment I put the record on and this music came out and I went into a kind of trance, it's almost, and I, what I did was I used as a metaphor, uh, a character appears and explains to me really what the blues is, not blues music, I mean having the blues and how you can put it into something and turn it into something beautiful. So. That's why the song Ebony McQueen in the movie is sung at the end by the whole town and the whole everybody and the marching band and everything. It's a celebration of that knowledge and that moment. And um, of course, there's lots of other songs that are talking about feeling down and whatever. But that's what the whole uh, conceptual piece is about. Well, I, I wanted to uh, read a quick quote that uh, is in the liner notes that you wrote, Dave, because I think it kind of mm -hmm. sums up 
you know, the whole project. It says these three vinyl albums, two vinyl singles, two cassettes, a book, and bits of script are a mixture of memories, melodies, the contents of my head, and lyrics from unconscious thought. So I think that's a yeah. really a really good uh, a really good quote there, Dave. I think it really sums up the, how it all started, you know, for you. Yeah, um, you see, when you're writing songs or stories or scripts or whatever, you actually um, you don't sit down and go, right, I'm going to write about this, you know, I'm going to write about the sea or I'm going to write about an ex-girlfriend. You don't sit down and with a piece of paper and go, right, I'm going to do that. Yeah. You just, well, well, me anyway, I don't know how other people do it, but I just don't try to write anything. I just, at some moments, things just come into me and into the guitar and the melody or whatever, and it all happens at once and some words and all of a sudden it's there. So, so much so that when I was working with an engineer that I work with now in Nashville a lot in my home studio, he was, he got a shot, he was kind of confused because I, I was making up these track songs and I would just, um, then say, okay, give me the mic. And I just sing nearly all the words in one go, but I'd never written them. Mm. And he was like, and, I, and he said, okay, I'll give me the lyrics and I'll put them up. And I said, I haven't, you know, so you could see them. And I said, I haven't written them yet. I said, that's them that just came out of my mouth. Mm. <laughs> and so, you know, I think the older you get, the more you understand that that's it. So, whether you're a painter, you go that brush stroke. No, that's it. I'm yeah. not changing it. It's just that's the way it is. Yeah. And so, um, and Annie and I really early on were very decisive like that. You know, never remixed anything. Honestly, in the whole of our recording, we never remixed anything. You know, people go, "Oh, that's not right. I'll have to mix it again." Yeah. We just do. A mix. I'll be at the board, da, 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 and he'd say, "What about this? What about that? Whatever." And then, or I'd be with Manu Dio, my mate, engineer, or whoever, and like all hands on the board, and like one, two, three, go, boom, and that was it. Wow. Do you ever uh, listen to some of the old, you know, the old Eurythmic songs on the albums, and and think, "Oh, I wish I had done something a little different here," or there was something I wanted to put there, or, or are you generally pretty much happy with the finished product? I mean, I, I hear that artists well, never, sometimes feel that way. Well, I never listen to any of them, you know, so I only hear them when they come on the radio or somebody else puts it on. Yeah. Or I, I might, might be in a, 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 a grocery store or something, and then obviously you hear them in a different way. They're distant and coming out of a strange speaker and like, you know, or somebody's playing it on their phone. And so, uh, but I know I don't go back and go, I could do, I could analyze something and go, ah, I could have made that synth sound a bit more like this, but then it would, it becomes very just like, well, that's just another way of looking at it, you know? Right, exactly. Oh, oh well, can I'm... you hang on, can you hang sure. on one second? Sure. Um, We should be playing something from Ebony McQueen here or something. <laughs> we, could, we could start singing the title track. <laughs> no, she does not want us to sing. No. <laughs> Hi, I'm back. Sorry. Actually, it's, it's six o'clock now, so we've been doing it for an hour, and I'm just checking something, and actually, um, I have to probably wrap it up with whatever you've okay. got. I don't, sure, no I, don't mind doing, I don't mind doing it again for another one down the line or whatever, but because <laughs> obviously it's a huge, long career. You can't cram it into every... Well, every... We, we want to give you a, an opportunity real quickly then to talk whatever you want to say about Ebony McQueen, which, by the way, 
that the title track is such an earworm. You, you, were, very, you were very kind and you sent us both of us the copy of the box set. Yes, and thank you. Really, I cannot get the title track itself. I, I, I hum that and I sing that all the time. It's such an earworm. It's such a great Definitely. song. Definitely. Yeah. And I just came from Virgin Radio uh, being interviewed. And uh, well, every interview I've done, they said, oh my God, I just keep waking up singing that. And, you know, I'm in the middle of a park with my kids and I'm singing it and they're going, what's that? But um, yeah, I mean, obviously, um, it's got nothing to do with the pop music today or whatever, but I I drive myself mad singing it myself. I'm like, oh, I don't know. But it's the thing, isn't it, where um, the mixture of the melody, um, the sort of phrase, fits together in such a way that you can never disconnect it, you know? Yeah. So yeah. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I've enjoyed it immensely. I think it's a great song. I love the whole, I, I think that the album is fantastic. You've got great reviews. Likewise. Uh, yeah. Ebony McQueen and uh, anything specific real quick. Well, like you said, the song itself is an earworm. I'm, I sing it all the time. I was singing it in the shower this morning. Nobody wants to hear that. Trust me. Mm. But no, the songs are the songs are so good, all of them, Dave, and um, they reveal more as you listen to them. One song that um, is really sticking with me right now is "Walking on Blue." I really love that song. Oh yeah, um, yeah, that's the song. You see, something there's a very sort of shipyard, coal mining, you know, kind of town, and quite grey skies a lot. You know, the northern the North Sea and coal and, you know, and, but there was one magic place that um, my dad took, took us to a couple of times when I was little old, I can barely remember. And it's a thousand year old abbey called Finkel Abbey, all crumbling. And there's a bluebell wood, right? So where the bluebells come up. And so in the movie, which will be sang by, uh, the song will be sang by the actor and his Indian uh, girlfriend from The Girl Next Door. He wanted to show us something really beautiful rather than, you know, the gray skies and everything. So he takes her to Finkel Abbey in the Blue Bow Wood and singing, I'm walking on blue and everything's, you know, and the whole lyrics. And then she will come in singing. And I just put a hint of a little Indian voice there, but so, it's um, it's a mixture of a sort of Indian type uh, melody string line, and um, but it's actually talking about more than that. Actually, it's like when you're in a place emotionally, or a dark place, or a place that is very difficult to get out of. It can be something in your imagination that the song is singing about. But in this particular case, it's that plus a real place yeah. that um, I can remember as being so beautiful uh, when we got there, you know. And that's what probably why my dad wanted to take us there to show us what these bluebell woods. And, uh, you know, things like that stay with you. And I reintroduced it as a place where the character would take, you wanted to show this girl or something beautiful, you know? Yeah. I like, I like, I, sorry, I was going to say, I love playing uh, Walking on Thin Air, which is, you know, a great sort of. I like that a, one too, yeah. Certain, it's a certain kind of uh, finger picking blues playing that I loved. Mississippi John Hurt mm -hmm. playing his, but I uh, made it turn into then the brass comes in and it's a whole dance sequence in the movie where he realizes the character that's playing me realizes the girl next door actually likes him and he starts singing this song and then he thinks everybody in the street and everywhere is dancing to the same tune that's in his head and, he, and then he gets a, a surprise when he, he realizes they're not you know what I mean it's just him and his imagination yeah um I have to say uh thanks to you Dave in the 90s I I uh 
expose myself to Mississippi John Hurt and some other artists, thanks to thanks to your influence. And um, oh. yeah, no, it's great stuff. And and um, I'm just uh, I was an only child, so I didn't grow up with a lot of brothers and sisters exposing me to music or parents. So it kind of came it came to me that way. So thanks thanks for that. All right, great. <laughs> well, I suppose I, I better go now before I uh, pass out. All right, <laughs> I've got like I've got a line of things to. Thank you for uh, thank you for spending some time with us. Yes, thank you. Really appreciate it. Dedicated to you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.